Dr. Paul Brand was born in 1914 to missionary parents living in rural India. He grew up in the Cauley Hills until the age of nine, when he was sent to England to be educated. Five years later, he got the terrible news that his father had died. He continued his education and eventually became a surgeon. He met his wife, Margaret, while at medical school. Margaret was also the child of missionary parents, though she had grown up in Africa as opposed to India. Both of them knew that they wanted to become missionary doctors, helping those in need of medical care in some of the places that needed it most. In 1946, they got their opportunity, as Dr. Brand was invited to join the staff of the Christian Medical College and Hospital in Vellore, India. There, he had an experience that he would never forget. Uh, but my first shock when I began to enter the hospital, big, fine hospital, was at the gate where I saw scores of desperately deformed uh, patients. Uh, they weren't coming into the hospital, but they were begging from the people who left and entered through the hospital gates. And they were getting money just by pity. They were holding out clawed fingers, and clawed hands. They were holding out uh, hands that had no fingers. And they were holding out, uh, at least they were sitting and displaying deeply ulcerated uh, feet. And I said to a, an older doctor as he was going in, I said, how do we allow all these terrible wounds to stay outside the hospital? And uh, he said, we, I said, we should take them inside and treat them and cure some of these things. And he smiled at my ignorance. He said, oh, these are just lepers. Almost as though he was talking about some inferior uh, race of, of, of people. And uh, he said, if we took them into the hospital, every other patient would run away. People are so scared, they call it the local name around there, they call it the living death, because they see that the, the limbs, the hands and feet, are gradually eroded away little by little, and uh, it's not looked upon as a disease, it's looked upon as a curse. And uh, so I, I, I tried to look impressed. He said, in any case, if, he, he said, in any case, I can see that you're looking at these clawed hands, you shouldn't be thinking about operating because they have, all these leprosy patients have non-healing flesh. And uh, if you make an incision for, an, for a, a, uh, an operation, you're simply going to add another wound which won't heal. Well, this, this just seemed instinctively to me to be so ridiculous and so, such a terrible thing for a scientific person to be talking about, but nevertheless, this is what the view was, and it became, to me, a personal challenge. After seeing the leper's plight, Dr. Brand decided to study leprosy in an attempt to help those who suffered from it, and to dispel clouds of superstition and fear that surrounded the condition. He collected money from his friends in England, and built a facility near the hospital to house and study lepers. The facility was modeled after a small village, and the intent was to not only treat lepers and study their disease, but to also teach them a trade so that they did not have to live as beggars. They built workshops and hired professional carpenters, tailors, gardeners, and others to teach the patients their trade. After some research, Dr. Brand believed that leprosy was not directly responsible for the disfigurement that lepers suffer from. One of the principal symptoms of leprosy is a deadening of the nerves. Lepers cannot feel pain in their effective limbs. Dr. Brand theorized that this deadening of the body's pain receptors was all that the leprosy bacteria did. The ulcers, infections, and disfigurements of the effective limbs occurred because lepers could not feel when they had accidentally been cut, bruised, or burned. These wounds, unfelt, were left untreated and neglected, which allowed infections to set in. Years of such abuse could lead to the destruction of the limb itself. Dr. Brand studied the patients at his facility carefully to see the progression of the disease for himself. And quite frequently, at the beginning, we would find that these boys would show up with a, a wound that hadn't been there in the morning. 
and then they were put on the on the pillory, and uh, uh, we would, we took them back hour by hour through that day, and we looked at all the tools that they had handled. If they were gardeners, we looked at the spades, and uh, and so on and so forth. And many of them were, were barefoot when they came in; they simply had little sandals. And finally, we would find, nearly always, we'd be able to find a blood stain, maybe on the handle of a, of a spade. And uh, we matched it with his hand, and where he had the little wound, uh, we checked it with a blood stain on the, on, the, on the handle. And he was teased unmercifully, because these were all boys having fun. Uh, extraordinary scientific group. But uh, whereas in the first few weeks, we had a whole lot of new wounds and a whole lot of these great discoveries. As the weeks went by, and these boys knew that they were going to be teased if they had developed a wound anywhere, hands or feet, uh, and were being questioned about all the things they should have done, which they didn't do to protect themselves, uh, we finally got to the point where we had very, very few uh, wounds, and um, we began to feel that it, was, it would be true to say that it was simply the lack of pain, uh, not the disease of leprosy, that uh, allowed them to wound themselves. With this discovery, Dr. Brand pioneered techniques to help prevent lepers from damaging their body further. He studied the effects of using limbs that cannot feel pain, and educated lepers on how to preserve their bodies and prevent further injuries. He once said, I thank God for pain. I cannot think of a greater gift I could give my leprosy patients. Not satisfied with this breakthrough, Dr. Brand continued his work. Around the same time he was performing his research, new medicines were developed that could treat leprosy itself. Sulfone medications can arrest the progress of the disease, but for most lepers, severe damage to their bodies had already been done. Dr. Brand pioneered new surgical techniques to reconstruct the damaged limbs of longtime lepers. He found ways to transplant tendons and muscles in order to transform club-like hands into workable limbs. He performed surgery on feet to correct the damage caused by years of unintentional abuse. Still, the societal damage of leprosy was sometimes worse than the physical. Dr. Brand found several of his early patients coming to him and asking that they would undo their surgeries so that their limbs would become useless again. Why? Because they could not find anyone willing to hire them with their scarred and deformed faces. They felt that they could only return to begging, where useless limbs would be an asset. Dr. Brand steadied himself for the task and got to work. He and his wife developed techniques to rebuild a leper's ruined face. They found ways to fix noses, cause eyebrows to grow again by transplanting skin, and otherwise repair as much cosmetic damage as they could. Margaret created a technique to help prevent blindness in those whose eyes had been affected by leprosy. Because their eyes could not feel pain, they did not blink often enough. The eyes would slowly dry out and eventually become blind. Margaret treated this by tunneling a muscle that's normally used for chewing and attaching it to the upper eyelid. Then she would give the patients gum to chew all day, and with every chewing motion, their eyes would blink. The brands continued their work to heal those whom most hospitals would refuse to treat at all. They would stick with patients through years of rehabilitation. The lepers could not possibly pay for the necessary surgeries, but money wasn't a concern for Dr. Brand. In fact, when he was employed by the hospital in Valor, he insisted on being paid the average wage for an Indian doctor, instead of the higher wages foreign doctors were typically paid. Dr. Brand would spend 19 years treating lepers in India, before moving to Carvile, Louisiana to work at the National Hansen's Disease Center, the only working leprosy treatment center in the continental U.S. There, he treated patients and further researched the disease. He made discoveries and invented techniques that helped lepers around the world, as well as having a wide variety of applications for other sicknesses. Over his career, he had many invitations to head major medical centers in England and the U.S., yet he chose to focus his work on helping lepers. Dr. Brand, looking back on his career, said, 
Because of where I practice medicine, I never made much money at it. But I tell you that as I look back over a lifetime of surgery, the hosts of friends who were once patients bring me more joy than wealth could ever bring. I first met them when they were suffering and afraid. As their doctor, I shared their pain. Now that I am old, it is their love and gratitude that illuminates the continuing pathway of my life. It's strange. Those of us who involve ourselves in places where there is the most suffering look back in surprise and find that it was there that we discovered the reality of joy. Happy are they who bear their share of the world's pain. In the long run, they will know more happiness than those who avoid it.